one. Hello once again, everyone. I'm your host, Ray Shasho. Welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends, brought to you by the Rockstar Chronicles Series 1, my new book, featuring over 45 intimate conversations with the greatest music legends the world will ever know. It's available now at bookbaby.com and amazon.com. John McEwen has been a professional performer since 1962, working as a magician in Disneyland's magic shop as a teenager. Music soon came along, which led to his long and varied career, first solo, then as a founding member of the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band in 1966. Over 10,000 concerts and 300 television shows throughout more than 3 million miles with the band. And as a solo performer, John has pursued his passion for performing and recording. He left NGDB at the end of their 50th year touring to focus on the demand for his solo performing and projects. Beyond performing, he concurrently has a rich history of creating, producing, and preserving original and traditional folk and acoustic music and taking it to new audiences. McEwen has made over 40 albums, seven solo that have earned four platinum and five gold recognition awards, Grammy nominations, CMA and ACM awards, and Emmy nomination, IBMA Record of the Year award, and performed on another 25 albums as guest artist. He's also produced more than seven albums and 14 film scores. And more than 300 concerts throughout his career, the first in 1965 at Long Beach, California, with Mr. Bob Dylan. In April of 2018, John officially became an author with his first book, The Life I've Picked, being published, a memoir, a telling of an incredible story from raising six kids in the music business and the ins and outs of being an iconic band member to being a single father to his current full and varied career. His book takes the reader on his unusual journey. Please welcome multi-instrumentalist, singer, songwriter, producer, author, best known for being the one of the founding members of the country rock group, the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, the string wizard himself, John McEwen to interviewing the legends. Hello, John. I wasn't sure you were talking about me, but thank you. <laughs> well, I, I thought I might have the wrong interview. And I had to cut it down. <laughs> oh. Well, you just came back from uh, Paris. How was it? It was very French. Very French, indeed. Well, it was wonderful. It, it, it's a, my wife and I, it's our fifth or sixth time there. And mm -hmm. we always say we should have stayed another day, another two days. But right. it's a wonderful place. It's got a lot of history, uh, a lot of duh a lot of history yeah and uh it's a it's good there's never a bad meal for one thing exactly i love i love the french food yeah and i'm one of those guys who love escargot i really do i don't oh you don't huh? <laughs> <laughs> i i was looking through your facebook page and i see you visited a couple of um jazz clubs in paris how were they Oh, they're totally different than clubs here because they're just different. You know, it's mm -hmm. uh, the people don't get paid very much at all, but they're right. great. they're great players. And, uh, the, the the music is uh, the two guitar players I saw made me mm -hmm. feel like I had I, I know two songs. So I was like, oh, <laughs> they play music. They love they love playing their music. What what what's the music scene like there? I mean, what are they playing on the radio? Are this pretty much like us, or so? I didn't listen to radio. Yeah, but, uh, didn't have one. But um, the music scene is it, it's not like here. It's like mm -hmm. there's a lot of concerts here. Yeah, a lot of performing and stuff. And one thing I noticed was that the venues are often noisy the clubs huh with tourists and people and regular people and and food and drink and, and mm -hmm. things of that nature but they're uh it's just it's different you have to go there right <laughs> yeah i would love to go i think we're going to do italy first 
Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Not a bad meal there either. Not a bad meal. Exactly. I think. All right. Well, I, I want to mention some tour dates you got coming out. One's pretty exciting. The Cafe Wa. Oh, does this, does this uh, publicize before that? Um, we could. Yeah. Well, that'd be good. It's December 8th. It's Cafe Wa. Right. In New York. It's going to be a lot of fun because I've got Matt Carsonis, who plays with me for 25 years now. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> now a lot and also joining is uh t michael coleman who played bass and sang with doc watson for 25 years very cool and uh we're gonna have a good time matt and i know too many songs and <laughs> t michael knows them all and it's going to be a good time and kevin twig the drummer that was on the made in brooklyn album right will be joining us there too He's not bringing a drum set. He's bringing some percussion toys. Oh, okay. He's about one of the best percussionists I've ever played with, too. Yeah. Well, December 9th, you'll be in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. A couple of shows there. That's uh, 4 o'clock and 8 o'clock or something like that. Okay. The, the late one sold out, so they added an afternoon. Good. And, January 28th. Um, this is cool, too. Uh, Capitol Theater with Mr. David Romberg, who I'll be interviewing pretty soon for the 50th year bash. Well, tell David I said hello. I sure will. <laughs> you know, I'm from D.C. originally. I'm in Florida, but I'm from D.C. originally. So I know all about you with the uh, cellar door. Constitution Hall, you played all those places, man, growing up. Yeah, Stiller Door with the Dirt Band was mm -hmm. a, a riot back in the in the 70s. Little, little room with people right so close, they clapped so loud. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, that graduated to playing Wolf, Wolf Trap. A couple Wolf of Trap, times. that's right and a few other venues around the town yeah yeah our claim to fame too we we kind of helped uh i guess emmy lou harris with her career in dc that was one of them oh wow yeah she started she was in george she played georgetown a lot as a matter of fact the first time i met her it was in dc was in dc the party at john starling's house okay music party and mm -hmm. He sang a few songs. I said, you know, I've only heard one other girl sing like you. Mm -hmm. It was uh, a couple of years ago. And she was, well, that was me. <laughs> well, no wonder she was so much like you. <laughs> I know she was in 72, I think. Yeah. I actually saw the, the Dirt Band in 75. Hmm. Uh, you guys opened up for Three Dog Night at the Cap Center. It was like 20,000 people there. Yeah, you probably don't remember that show. Bonnaroo, it was Bonnaroo, Three Dog Night, uh, and you guys were in the middle. Yeah. We did well, too. You did very well. Yeah. yeah. Three Dog Night went out, and every time they'd start a song, thunderous applause. <laughs> oh, yay! The end, no applause. <laughs> yeah, every song they did, there was no applause. They'd start the next song, which was mm -hmm. it, and the place would go crazy. Yeah. And no applause. <laughs> yeah, the Dirt Band was big in D.C., definitely. I want to talk about Made in Brooklyn, first of all. Okay. Uh, I love the album, by the way. It was really cool. And I want to bring up some some tunes I really like. My favorite song on the album was Miner's Night Out. Oh, thank you. Oh, uh, did did you write that tune? Yes, sir. Wow. I, I mean, that sounds like a traditional, you know, song from the South. And I'm, I'm thinking the Confederate. and It's very military sounding. And, you know, what a great song, man. One of my best pieces, actually. And I, uh -huh. I wrote it on the Dirt Band bus when we were heading from Kansas City to Denver. And I tuned my banjo to the bus engine. Really? And played along with that as a drone. Because we were on I-70 across mm -hmm. Kansas, and that's the same thing. You know what it's like to go, if you don't know what it's like to go to, across Kansas, just put your nose on a ping pong table right next to the white line and stare at it for eight hours. 
<laughs> That's a great description. And, uh, <laughs> and I wanted to write a song that would be like what you might have heard in the mining camps. Right. At the end of the workday, where one guy would start playing, another one would join, and then another one, and then by the middle of the song, everybody was playing along. It's one of the best original tunes I've heard in a long time. Well, thank you. It, it is great, man. I was blown away when I heard that song. It was all recorded for Chesky Records, right, in Brooklyn, with one microphone hmm. and one very special stereo microphone that mm -hmm. actually sounds like surround sound sometimes when you play it back through normal situation really in fact my daughter called me when she got the album and said dad i wish you would have told me about this record i thought somebody came in behind me <laughs> <laughs> well that's the way it is you play it and you're in a van it sounds like there's people sitting around the van yeah yeah. The, uh, the guy that developed the microphone understood how to get onto a recording. Right. The effect that happens when so you drop your car keys, you hear mm -hmm. them on the ground low behind you on the left. A huh. bird flies over your head. Yeah. You hear it flying across. Oh, yeah, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, he figured out that the, the way the sound goes into the ears. Right tells you where something is at and you can replicate that huh it's, uh, that album featured david bromberg john right. Nash, martha redbone uh, steve martin plays on a warren zevon song yeah i thought was a wonderful pairing oh yeah oh yeah that's your buddy right from way back well we went to high school together our senior year but before that we that you mentioned the magic shop in disneyland yeah we were trying at 16 years old to get the job that was the dream job mm -hmm. in the magic shop. And we did same day. And what, what was Steve Martin like in high school? Was it, was he funny? Well, he was trying to be funny <laughs> and in trying he was because yeah. he heard anybody, but he was doing by trying to be funny. He was doing, Amos and Andy material and doing a, on, on the, the morning announcement at school, you mm -hmm. know, uh, he'd do the announcements and he'd lead, he was a cheerleader. He led cheers wearing a pink tutu. And that was kind of funny. <laughs> and, uh, that developed into a relationship that led me to producing his first album, his mm -hmm. bluegrass album, Songs for the Five String Banjo. The Crow, new right. five-string banjo, and we won a Grammy. Yep, and that was pretty cool. And uh, <clears throat> and my brother was his manager and producer for years. Mm -hmm. uh, he dropped out after about eighteen or twenty years, and uh, Steve continued on. Oh yeah, and Steve came the arrow on the head and came from the, the rest that, is history the arrow came from the magic shop in disneyland did it really i didn't know that and we'd huh. always wear an arrow huh in tricks it was a stupid thing to have <laughs> an arrow through your head but it was uh either that or nose glasses <laughs> john you you taught him uh taught him how to play the pant banjo is that right well, he says that, and I think that's very kind of him. Uh huh. And I was just a quicker study. We both heard the banjo the first right. time together, and we both got one. Mm -hmm. And my father bought me my first banjo as a surprise for my 18th birthday. And a year later, he said, I don't think the, the music path is a good thing. You're going to regret it. They always say that. <laughs> I'm glad he said that. Yeah. Especially his opinion. And a year later, he said, you're doing pretty good. <clears throat> you mentioned the Bob Dylan concert. I had to borrow $2,000 from my father. Really? Picture you or anyone at 19 years old. Dad, could, uh, would you co-sign a note for me with the bank so I could have $2,000 to hire a guy you've never heard of? <laughs> um, anyway, 
I paid him back six weeks later. He was he was oh, just, he was now, shocked, right? <laughs> well, maybe this music thing can work. Yeah. And uh, he passed away at fifty-two. Uh, very few short years after yeah. that. And uh, <clears throat> go ahead. Next question. <laughs> well, well, Steve's a pretty good uh, banjo player now, isn't he? He was a good banjo yeah. player when he started after right. about a year. Yeah. And, and he kept practicing. The banjo meant a lot to him. Yeah. The way to get away, if his set wasn't going well, he'd go, I'm going to play the banjo. And he could play <laughs> <laughs> something that would give him time to think. Right. I love Steve Martin. He's, he's great. I saw him a long time ago in Vegas. It was at the Riviera Hotel. Martin Mall was in the audience. Was he opening for Ann Margaret? No, no, no. It was just him. He headlined. Oh, I think it was when he first started headlining in Vegas. Oh. Yeah. He, he was great. What, one of the things he did, he, he did this balloon tricks. And then he made a balloon and he says, look, gonorrhea. You know, he had, I, I mean, I busted out laughing. Yeah. <laughs> It was so funny. And of course, on Saturday Night Live. And yeah, he's great. Um, back to the album. You're very, you're incredible too when you do uh, instrumentals. And I love the Acoustic Traveler. Oh, well, thank you. I was hoping you'd mention that. Yeah. That yeah. should have been in Game of Thrones. That's kind of a Game of Thrones type song you can put, you know, in there somewhere. Are you looking for a job as an agent? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> it's, yeah. a, it's, it's a good song. Acoustic Traveler? Yeah. It was a real shock to me. It was one that I made up the night before the session. Mm -hmm. And I had to have one more song. And I threw a bunch of numbers on a table and put them <clears> in order. And OK, there's my chord chart. And oh, this works. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. and uh, ended up recording it in one take. Wow. And uh, got very lucky with that one. And, and people loved it. It's yeah. things you can never tell. Sometimes working under pressure is a good mm -hmm. thing. That was working under pleasure and pressure. And That's what they say, you know, and leave the mistakes in there. If you make a mistake in a the song, they say, leave it in there. You know, sometimes... Works out better that way. That's what I always hear. The um, Dirty Life and Times. Wow. The, the lyrics on that, man. Hoping for a woman with low esteem. I What, what a line. Well, and thank, uh, you, thank you, Warren Zevon. Who <laughs> yeah, she, she won't love me, but her sister will. I mean, that's a, that's a great tune. <laughs> you and, and you uh, was that. Um, John uh, Cohen, that's it. Is Cowan that's saying that on that no, track? That was Matt Cartsonis. Oh, okay. He also wanted to do wanted to do the song because we right. wrote it for him. Okay. And uh, he said, "I need to write a song for you or something." And and, and uh, he put that together, and then they went out and played it. And then Warren passed away. Oh man, Jeez. And, uh, this is kind of an honoring of that situation. And uh, Matt does a great job of it. Yeah. Matt's a great player. And he'll be at the Cafe Wa with me. Good. He brings his mandola and guitar mm -hmm. and a bunch of strange, funny songs. And, mm -hmm. and uh, some regular, we do some old dirt band songs that I love. Well, mm -hmm. most of them are old. And, uh, and some new songs. We do, we'll be doing several songs from Made in Brooklyn and uh, a lot of songs from the Circle Be Unbroken album, the Will the Circle Be Unbroken album. Right. Which is still in the top 20 on Amazon mm -hmm. for two years. It's been, and it's been in the top five a lot, but ever since the Ken Burns show, mm -hmm. Country Music aired, it went up, 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 up to the top of the Amazon charts on three different charts. That's hard to do on Amazon. That's very hard to do. I thought. Uh, so. Yeah, because they, they've got a, a lot of material on Amazon, number one. And, yeah. Uh, to get, get that high, it's like almost impossible. 
But uh, again, you, you you got these uh, instrumentals that I love. Jules Theme's another one. Talk about that track. Which one? Jules Theme. Oh, that was actually a song I wrote for the piano. Okay. I have a recording of it with playing piano, guitar, and bass. But right. And I wanted to do it on this album, and uh, so I I played it on guitar instead, and. I'm glad you say you like that. I it's, do like that. I like all your acoustic stuff too. I mean, the, you, you can go many ways in your music. I mean, you, you can play anything. You, know, <laughs> you really can't. I'm not like Jerry Douglas or Sam Bush. Right. I don't play as many notes, but I play some that I think are, I don't know, well thought out or uh, arrangement is my strong point. Yeah, arranging the music to be played. Right. Why don't you lay out this verse and then back up on the next one and then, then take the whatever. It's just arranging the piece is what's important. Like Miner's Night Out is an example of that. Exactly. I was I talked to Peter Asher yesterday. Oh wow. And he 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 was talking about that. You know that's what makes a, a great producer. And. Um, I had, uh, he was with Kate Taylor because she's got a new album out. Mm -hmm. Kate, James Taylor and Livingston Taylor's uh, sister. Oh. Yeah. So we were, we were talking about that same very thing. Mountain um, Whippoorwill. Yeah. Fiddle, that's Fiddle Heaven, man. You know, great fiddle on that tune. Well, thank you. Yeah. I you did. really are a master with the fiddle and the banjo. Well, uh, I appreciate that, but I'm okay with the fiddle, but uh, Stuart Duncan's a master. Yeah. <laughs> and, Connor and Jay Ungar, the guy that played most of the fiddle on the, on the Brooklyn album, Jay Ungar. Right. And he was, he was incredible because a lot of the things on Made in Brooklyn were one, well, they were all one take mm -hmm. and, uh, a lot of them were the first take and Jay just played great. I just, I, I, I would, my, my direction to Jay was things like on the uh, Brooklyn Crossing song mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Tune, and in D minor tuning, <clears throat> I told Jay, I says, when you get to the second half of your solo, make it sound Jewish. <laughs> and he did. I, <laughs> I uh, felt like I was watching Fiddler on the Roof for a minute. <laughs> and uh, he picked the right scales and da, 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 da. Uh, he just really is good. He's one of New York's uh, treasures. Yeah. And of course, you, you put in Miss, the, uh, the old classic Mr. Bojangles on the album as well. Well, we were sitting yeah. around talking with David Bromberg. We mm -hmm. were finished. And David Bromberg was a guy that, okay, before Mr. Bojangles came out as a single mm -hmm. or the week that was coming out, right? I booked a date up in New, New York, Philadelphia area um, to see, so we could go meet Jerry Jeff Walker. Cool. And Tom we're putting out Mr. Bojangles as a single. Yeah. We went to the Main Point Coffee House and we wanted to hear him do it. We got there late though, and his set was over, and there was only about twenty people there. Oh man! And he was laying on the floor, face down. <laughs> really? We called it a, a wild turkey night, and the turkey won. <laughs> but David Bromberg was backing him up then. This mm -hmm. was 1970. Huh. And we said, and I, at the session for Made in Brooklyn, I said, "Do you remember that, David?" And he goes into the story about how it came about. And, and so he and Matt ended up sharing the lead on Mr. Bojangles. And I just looked around the room. I says, you know what, Bojangles in D? Yeah, you, you have bass player, are you? Yeah, okay. David, you wanna record it? It starts and we recorded it. And it was that, that was uh, the way it went down. Wow. <laughs> the real, the way a lot of that music we did 14 songs in two days that's amazing 
and uh, we rehearsed for four days, so that made it possible. But mm -hmm. Chesky Records records, they did it in an old church in Brooklyn where they do a lot of their recordings because it's mm. a wonderful sounding room. It's mm -hmm. not working anymore, but mm -hmm. it's uh, that one microphone picks up everything. Best drum sound I've heard on a record. Uh, I didn't believe it would happen. I, I said, can we use headphones? We won't have any monitors. And Norman Chesky and oh, the, his brother David said, no, you have to listen to each other. Mm -hmm. You can't hear the other guy and he's playing lead, then you're playing too loud. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <You're wrong. laughs> well, we'll That's interesting. And after we recorded the first song, everybody was like, yeah, let's do another one. Yeah. Really exciting. Huh. And you guys were in the zone after that. It's yes. amazing. Yeah. David played one of the coolest electric guitar licks on on uh, on She Darks the Sun. Mm -hmm. And John Cowan, who's a great bluegrass singer. Are you familiar yeah. with John Cowan? Yeah. Yeah. He's playing bass with the Doobie Brothers for the last yeah. seven years. Yeah. He started, for those who don't know, yeah. with uh, New Grass Revival. Mm -hmm. player, lead singer mm -hmm. <clears throat> and i've been trying to get him to record this song for several years and i called him up i said john will you sing it on on the album for me he goes yep i will well just let me know the key so i can tell everybody and he said oh, what was it oh yeah he said g and that is like really high mm -hmm. And uh, you, you sure it's not E, right? <laughs> no, we're going to do it in G. I said, okay. <laughs> anybody ready? And and he he just killed it. He was yeah. really wonderful. And uh, anyway, you got some great players on that album, man. You know, David Romberg, John uh, John, John Carter, Carter Cash. Cash. Yeah, John Carter Cash. He, yeah, I wanted him to do one of his dad's favorite songs. Mm -hmm. And, and he did a fine job of it. And uh, we had, everybody was on that one, about 14 people, about wow. years and stuff. Huh. And, Martha uh, Redbone was also on the album. <laughs> Martha Redbone is yeah. an incredible Brooklyn artist. Mm -hmm. Just happens to be living in Brooklyn. Really? She's a Native American, a Black mm -hmm. and Native American. Mm -hmm. And um, we had this song of, William Blake, the poet from England, who wrote things like Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright. Mm -hmm. uh, I never understood, but <laughs> he wrote a lot of poetry mm -hmm. in 1830, 1840. Right. And is known to anyone that studies English as a language study. And we, I was worried about taking a William Blake song and turning it into a song, taking mm -hmm. a William Blake poem. Right, right. And I sent this to some of the Blake professors that teach it at, at uh, Princeton and Harvard, or, yeah, and Harvard. And the response was about the same. He lives again. Blake lives again. <laughs> you know, because we use all of his words. I only reused a couple of phrases so mm -hmm. it was kind of like a chorus yeah and uh and that that's uh i rose up at the dawn of day just came out wonderful and that has everybody on it that has matt singing a verse and john yep. cowan singing a verse and martha does most of the most of the singing and uh that that's an interesting concept bringing famous poets and putting them into music, you know, maybe even do Shakespeare. Uh, have they done Shakespeare uh, word I, for word, I guess? I haven't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I could see you doing that. <laughs> I wanted to do it as if, let's say William Blake um, immigrated to, to Appalachia. It left right, England right. And, and went to the Appalachian Mountains mm -hmm. and hung around a bunch of banjo and fiddle players. Right and turned his poems into music. Maybe yeah. they would have sounded like this. So that's what we did. We, yeah. Fact, 
full album with Martha called Garden of Love. Right. I produced it and played on it every cut huh. and stuff. It's one of my finest recordings, actually. It just didn't didn't get a lot of attention. I was hoping it would get a Grammy nomination for folk album, but I didn't get it out there in time. But uh, one year, one of your tracks, I Rose Up. Who, who's singing on, on I Rose Up? Yeah, that's the one. That's the William Blake song. Oh, that is the William Blake song. Yeah. Okay. I Rose Up at the Dawn of Day. She's, yeah. Martha starts it off. Because that's a very powerful track. Oh, yeah. She's a wonderful singer. Yeah. She, uh, she could. Yeah. And then uh, Matt Carsonis takes a verse, and then John Cowan takes a verse. I'm like you. I'm, I, it should have been a very popular tune you know it's uh, not over yet yeah that's right you never know well it's a great album i give it five stars man just because um it, it's got everything on there you know and the musicianship uh, you, you do a great job you really do i thought it was my best sounding record sound, yep. uh, the sound is good it's you very know? good the, the instruments all sound like they're, when I finished the first song, I went into the other room to listen through headphones and I felt like I was listening to us playing live. Mm -hmm. now, usually when you do this, mm -hmm. it always sounds like the studio. Right. It always sounds like, oh, they're not playing, but it was such a live sound. Mm. It was a wonderful experience to- uh, It's a great album. I, I enjoyed it. Well, I hope people listen to you and go out and check it out on Amazon or <clears throat> wherever they check out their music. Well, I've got multiple sites everywhere. I'm going to promote the hell out of it. <laughs> well, I have, a, I have a, a very high appreciation for you doing that. Because Thank you. That's what I do. You know, I mean, I and, love you guys. I, you know, I, I, I was brought up with music since day one i love music all kinds of music every genre and i just want to keep the good music going you know sadly what's on the radio today i can't take it anymore and i know what you mean all all the players all the great players are fading away and they've been taken over by dance music and i i, I can't deal with that <laughs> you know i, I have a and i don't understand why restaurants play boom 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 yeah. boom boom, boom, boom. Uh, they have music there's a bass drum and a couple of instruments that repeat and repeat and repeat and then you know restaurant music is not that that's background you know right it's, right oh sometimes it's almost irritating very irritating and, uh, sorry about the computer that's okay but uh yeah. Yeah. On, on your website, the Nashville sessions, are you selling those just as MP3s? I guess. Is no, that how they, it? They can be bought through Amazon or right. Spotify too, I think. Now, wherever downloads are made. Because I listened to that too. And, and there, you got back in history with Leon Russell. I mean, wow. Hidden gem wow. there. That's just me and Leon Russell. That yeah. A, it's a great song. Well, thank you. That came about at one in the morning at Leon's house in in Nashville when he was living there. Yeah. And uh, that's a recent release. It's a compilation of things I have in my hard drive huh. and, and a couple of new things. And uh, the things in my hard drive were, I've got to use this Leon song. Oh, I'll use it. I'll use it this summer. And uh, I was at Leon's playing the guitar and he says, I didn't know you played guitar like that. Keep it going. I'll, I'll, I'll write a song around it. We'd been talking about, you know, the world situation and how everything was bombing everywhere and mm -hmm. fires and all that. Yeah. And he wrote that song and I played bass and mandolin and guitar on it. He played keyboards and drums, keyboard drums mm -hmm. and, uh, and sang. Leon was a riot to watch singing because really he was in a big easy chair, you know. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> laying back singing from his chair. And uh, that was fun. Then the lyrics are great. Oh, pardon? The lyrics are great. Yeah, Darcy, yeah. he wrote those lyrics right as, as I was playing. And uh, it was a, quite an honor. Leon and I had known since 1966 when he was watching a Dirt Band rehearsal. Huh. When we were opening for Merle Travis, our first big important job at the Ash Grove, which is yes, now Grove. Yeah. And uh, he, he was asked, uh, would you boys like to sign a record contract? Well, I'm sorry, sir, but we just signed one with Liberty Records. Oh, mind if I listen? And uh, he just hung around and listened for an hour. Mm -hmm. And he was he had just finished doing this diamond ring with Gary Lewis and the Playboys. Right. And uh, he was in from Tulsa to be a piano player and became part of the wrecking crew. And uh, I got to know him and ended up playing with him a dozen times, hired him a few times. Hmm. That was really fun. I mean, to think that I could hire Leon Russell. <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody's got to hire him. <laughs> I produced a show in Deadwood, South Dakota called the Deadwood Jam. Right. A uh, 12 hour show that I, I, I ran it for 15 years and I hired Leon twice. He was great. Hmm. I put him on a show with uh, Marsha Ball. Do you know her? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Marsha Ball is a fine, fine piano player. Yeah. And I met her over here mm -hmm. and Leon I'd seen all around the country. Mm -hmm. And that's a cute, that's a cute story. Pause for a moment, please. Um, well, I want, we were talking about the Nashville sessions. We, I, I guess we finished up with Leon, but you said you had a story, I think about Leon, didn't you? Leon oh, Russell. Thank you. Okay. So I've got Marsha Ball and Leon Russell on the same day. Right. I'm sitting on Leon's bus and he goes, Hey, John, uh, I, I, if you have the time, because I was producing the show, mm -hmm. I know you're busy, but if you think she uh, has some time, because you asked Marsha Ball to come onto my bus and so I can tell her how much I admire her and how much blah, 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 blah. And so I, I get off the bus a little while later and I'm looking for Marcia because like she's going to be on in an hour and she comes up to me hey John if, if you have the time if, if I don't want to bother you or anything but <laughs> I've always wanted to meet Leon Russell that's funny and I said, Marcia I'll show you how easy it is <laughs> I'll over to the bus I knock on the door Leon Marcia I'll be back in a half hour anyway, that's funny they talked and had a great time yeah Someone who had a wonderful voice that was on your out, Penny Nichols that's on Darcy Farrell. That was my first girlfriend. Really? Is that yes. right? Yes. And we were playing folk music around the clubs of LA uh -huh. and uh, playing with Mary McCaslin a lot, right. a folk artist. And this is before the Dirt Band that mm -hmm. we did that. And um, gosh, I was 18 or 19 and she was... 18 or so mm -hmm. um, we kept a relationship up after we separated or broke up or i saw penny at the ash grove a year and a half after we'd kind of broken up and we both looked at each other and said at the same time it was my fault <laughs> yeah no it was my fault <laughs> no it was no no we were both with somebody else and yeah so it was their fault yeah. but uh, I asked her a couple years back yeah. if she would record Darcy Farrell with me because I, yeah. I like to play it in detuning on the guitar. Right. And I overdubbed a couple instruments and she sang it. We just did it in one take, no no fixes. And her, her voice is pure. Beautiful voice. Yeah. And it was really good. And then she passed away a couple years ago. I saw that. Yeah. And, but I got Darcy Farrell and I didn't mm -hmm. want her sitting around in my hard drives, you know, yeah. and uh, I transferred everything to digital and, and uh, over the years and used that. Makes me sad when, uh, especially women, 
women artists who sing beautifully pass, pass on so young, you know, I like, um, uh, um, Nicolette Larson, you know, I was yeah. very sad when she left, you know, and Minnie Ripperton, another beautiful voice, you know, and, um, and then there's ones like Linda Ronstadt who just lose yeah, their, I know her Parkinson's has really affected her to where she, she can sing lower, but she just can't do what she used to do. And she goes, and she used to, yeah, I do. I spend more time with my daughter and I, I'm, I'm okay. I'm yeah. happy. And I listen to those recordings and I go, Whoa, that was nice. Oh, I'm glad I did that. I wish I could do that, but I don't do that anymore. And I know. I yeah. talked to Peter about Linda and, you know, she got re-diagnosed, but the new diagnosis was worse than what she had before is what I understand. I haven't talked to her in a, in a year, I don't think. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, Peter uh, was her manager yes. you know, back in the day and everything. And she, he, he still talks to her from time to time. Yeah, yeah I, I met Peter Asher 10 years ago. Mm hmm years ago when I, at a this sounds like I'm name dropping but at a birthday party at at uh, Eric Idle's house oh wow that's and, cool and Tom Hanks comes in and Eric <laughs> me to Tom Hanks I have always wanted to meet yeah hi Mr. Hanks my name is oh I know you're John McEwen from Nitty Gritty Dirt Band <laughs> When I drove from New York to Aspen the first time in the 70s, I only had the Symphonium Dream album. What is it you say in Japanese? <laughs> a cut on that album of banjo solo where I say a few Japanese phrases. And he, huh. was, he was like right on. How about that? Yeah. And uh, hey, so hey, Joe, you got the Oak Ridge Boys. I know Joe, Joe Bonsall. He's been on my show a couple of days. Nice guy, you know, yeah. country guy from Philly. <laughs> Just like you from Oakland, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not from Oakland. First yeah. thing I learned to say when I was born was, get me out of here. <laughs> and I went to move to LA. Yeah. But go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. Well, yeah, I, I was just saying, I know Joe. He's a, he's a really good guy. And uh, love the Oak Ridge Boys, and you and you got the Oak Ridge Boys on your that second track, Hey Joe, that which is a, a fun track. I yeah. asked if they, if they would sing on it, on that and another song, which is one of my best recordings, a version mm -hmm. of Sleepwalk that I'm playing the lap slide guitar on. Yeah, that uh, it's uh, they sang on those two songs, and mm -hmm. I got to the session about mm -hmm. nine o'clock for a ten o'clock session. I had to you know set up the tapes and get the studio ready and stuff yeah and there's a bus in the parking lot oh that's not the oak ridge boys bus probably I don't know. and about quarter to ten they start strolling in i says is that your bus and, oh yeah we we just played the state fair in indiana mm -hmm. and we decided to come to the studio and do the session and then go home hmm. then they wouldn't let me pay them no so, really Oh, well, they were big dirt band fans. And I yeah. Oh, yeah. Appreciative of that. And, uh, but they did a fine, fine job. Yeah. You know what's interesting? You, you the newsman, your little narrative about selling, you know, the guy that's selling newspapers, Steve. Yeah. That was, that was interesting. You know, I never thought about it that way. Well, you know, that guy, Steve, mm -hmm. newsman, that you can hear about is, a preview of my next album, which is a talking record. Really? Really? Talking with music behind it. Very cool. Well, I'm going to put a film score type of music or like that music that kind of fits the story with various poems. I've got a poem from a letter from a soldier in the Civil War, and then a poem, a writing, a whatever, from a Vietnam veteran. Huh. And there, they were both very hard to to read because of the emotion in their writing. Oh my God! Really? You no, know, it was like, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You just have to. You don't have to win. Just keep your head low. 
Right. You know, and as long as you can make the monsoon, you'll be okay. Yeah. What the Vietnam guy kept saying. And they're going to give us a welcoming show, boys. Yeah. You, you can count on that. We were, you know, anyway, that, that's a, that's a, a, it's my best project, I think. I, I know I'm not going to get a Grammy as a singer. <laughs> okay. I can understand. <laughs> but, spoken word album yeah. might have a category or a, I might have a shot. Yeah. And the, uh, the Civil War guy you're talking about, what side was he on? North. He was in the North. Okay. And uh, then Martha Redbone's, oh, that's on, that's on the National Sessions. Right. My best folk music record ever I've ever made was My Warfare Will Soon Be Over with Martha Redbone. Mm -hmm. That's on the, this album you're talking about. Right. Which I hope after you play your interview, the yep. Spotify account goes up by thousands. And I'll I make, hope so. I'll make yeah. eight or 10 cents. <laughs> You sound like me with my books. That's about how much I make. <laughs> um, I want to mention The Life I've Picked, which is a great title for your book, I, by the way. I thought about titles as I was writing this, which was uh -huh. a 10-year period. I wanted, to, I wanted to capture... It's one, one thing. Don't be so arrogant. Don't tell your story. Right. Uh, well, it is my story. I've got to tell it. Okay, I'll talk about this. I don't, okay, anyway, I spent 10 years writing this book. That's about right. <laughs> and I had titles with mm -hmm. it, you know, along the dirt road, you know, you know, the, the road less dirt, the, <laughs> the road less traveled except for, you know, it's, uh, and finally, when I had the manuscript finished, and it had to be turned in the next day with the title. Yeah. I told my wife, I'm going downstairs to the studio mm -hmm. and I might be a while because I've mm -hmm. got to figure out the title I want to put on this book for the life I've picked. Mm -hmm. Wow. The life Light bulb. <laughs> so I wrote that down and I put it over there. And then uh -huh. I looked at my other two or three pages of titles and I. <laughs> That was it. <laughs> and Steve Martin liked it, so yeah, he was a uh, he was very encouraging to me for writing this book. Right, that's good. Stories after story. If you have time, could you read this? Or would you want mm -hmm. to read that? You know, I don't know. And he finally said, "You ought to put these together in a book." Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I did. Oh, it's a great title. A banjo player's nitty gritty journey. And that's, that's another, uh, you know, great part to the, the title, the nitty gritty journey. I love that. Well, thank you. Yeah. We're going to promote the hell out of that one too. Yeah. Good. It'll go up two points in Amazon. Two points in Amazon. It was number one for a couple of weeks when it came out. Really? That's, a, that's incredible. Book charts or biographies or whatever well you got a lot of reviews that which is the most important thing on amazon you know a lot of yeah. great reviews they're good comments good yeah all five star reviews pretty much except for the one one star right who did cool. that i think it's one of the guy's ex-wives <laughs> well yeah. that would make sense i guess <laughs> yeah. she hates me but that's okay yeah uh, you know, it's amazing that the dirt band's got such a following, you know, from years and years and years, you know, you're just one of those, it was one of those bands that, you know, it's always popular, always has and always will be popular. Always somewhat popular. Yeah. <laughs> somewhat. Somewhat. It, it never did 10,000 people a night for 100 nights. Right. 8,000 or 12,000. Indicative of the actual career of the dirt band was, let's see. Well, one night we played the Albuquerque State Fair. Record crowd, sold out, 12,000 people. Really? Feeling pretty hot and heavy. And, oh, we oh yeah. No, oh, we're gonna kill in El Paso the next <laughs> night. The next night on a baseball field in El Paso, 
you know what 300 people look like in the grandstand? <laughs> <laughs> About like the uh, the COVID outbreak. <laughs> At least they weren't wearing masks, you know. It was always like this. Yeah, yeah. But there's a lot of that up there. and. But you, you guys never sold out, which was the, you know, important thing, I guess. You never, you know, like disco days, you never wrote a disco record, <laughs> you know, you, you kept to your roots, you know. Well. Or did you want to write a disco record and, and, and make a lot of money? <laughs> no, I don't, uh, I, I don't, I thought disco was a good thing to come along, but uh, to give music a rest. Yeah, yeah. Because then when we came back in the, in the eight, in the 1980s with mm -hmm. recording in Nashville mm -hmm. and we had 21 country hits. So that was a good thing. Yeah, exactly. You know, one band that surprised the hell out of me is the Dillards. I'm like, yeah, I, I saw them on the Andy Griffith show and I said, man, these guys play great, but is that really how they look? <laughs> you know, are they really, really like that? And I saw pictures of them. Some of the pictures of them on uh, on Amazon, they look like a pop group, the way they were dressed, like a 60s pop group. But, you know, they, they, they are uh, they're an amazing band. The Dillards were a perfect combination of Flat and Scruggs, Les right. Scruggs, and the Smothers Brothers. Huh. And I thought, and they brought the folk and the bluegrass, everything together with right. incredible humor, thanks to Mitch Jane and rodney right it was a perfect setup the mandolin player never said a word he just stood there watching, <laughs> laughing and doug had an ever-present grin one guy with a pipe the corn pipe. no the pipe was it was miss jade with right the talking yeah and uh yeah in the ozarks when we uh get around the name of the kid we people often just go to the dictionary and pick out a pretty word <laughs> And that, that kind of explains my one of our neighbors, Vagina Sue. <laughs> you know, it was like funny stuff. You couldn't say that word in the '60s and '70s. Yeah, in public. But, but uh, you you produced and directed a documentary about the Dillards, right? You're a good man. Oh yeah. <laughs> yes, I wanted to say thanks for getting me in the music business mm -hmm. and ca capture them at their best is called the night in the ozarks right recorded with four cameras and four film cameras and two video cameras and uh, as if they're rehearsing getting ready to go on the road and it was such a cheap production i only had a rodney i've only got enough money to shoot each song <laughs> one and a half times <laughs> you know? so can we get some first takes? Oh, we'll have, a, we got a lot of first takes. Yeah. So it's stacked up. So a couple of songs had to be done over. We could do them a second time. Right. And not run out of film. But uh, it was, it was a good, it was a good thing. The legendary Cafe Wah. Yeah. I had such a crush on Charlene Darling. Yeah who is Maggie Peterson Mancuso, the actress that plays Charlene, especially when she did Dooley, the song Dooley. Mm -hmm. Do they do that in concert? Do they do Dooley? They always do Dooley. They do? Yeah. <laughs> I figure that. And somebody touched me and- uh, Yeah. But uh, yeah, they do a lot of the Dillard's songs, yeah. Yeah. Rodney Dillard is a good guy. I was I was on, I think it was Wikipedia, but I Herb Penderson and Chris and uh, Dewey Martin were part part of the Dillards at one time. Who, who'd you say? Uh, Dewey Martin and um, Herb Penderson. Peterson. Was it Peterson? P E D E R, I believe. Okay. Uh, yeah, Herb was a, a is a great banjo player and a wonderful right. voice. And uh, Dewey Martin's a drummer, I believe. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they didn't need drums, but Dewey filled the slot pretty well. Mm -hmm. And Rodney was always, 
you know, the nitty gritty dirt band was in Paint Your Wagon, the movie. Right. The movie with Lee Marvin and Lee Clint Marvin. Lee. Yeah. Clint Eastwood, both learning how to sing. They, they didn't learn, but they were, they did it. But uh, I thought the Dillards should have had that role. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I had a better manager, my brother. And uh, my brother Bill, he managed Pee Wee Herman, Steve Martin, the Sunshine Company, a pop group for a couple of years before drugs showed him the way how to break up a group. And, uh, and uh, Steve Landisberg, anyway, he managed, really? he managed uh, Robert Schimmel. Do you know that comedian? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He produced his albums. Uh, Anyway, Steve Landisberg is from Barney Miller, right? Comedian, right. incredibly funny comedian. He was great. He just couldn't get it out there, you know. <laughs> and uh, it was that difficulty of this business. Yeah, and Pee Wee's from Sarasota. From uh, he's from Sarasota, Florida. Pee Wee, Pee Wee Herman. He went to oh. high school here. Yeah. Yeah, and he got in trouble here too. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I was watching the Muppets with my granddaughter. I swear to God, and you probably know this, they, they did a Muppet of you, didn't they? They had you oh. and the whole band, the Muppets. A Muppet of what? Of you. Me? Yeah, it was a Muppet of you. It was exactly you. And, and they had the whole band of the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. They're all Muppets. I didn't know that. Yeah, I'll have to say that because it's, you know, they didn't ask your permission, but they, it was definitely you. The beard, everything. It looked just like you. And he's wow. playing a banjo. <laughs> well, I, I did a, how, what year was that? It must have been a long time ago. It was a while ago, yeah, but they're still showing it. I did a, one of my favorite recordings was with Paul Williams and uh, Gonzo, the Muppet. Yeah, right. It, and uh, that was really fun. I, I produced a DVD called Going Back There Someday. Mm -hmm. And it had Willie Nelson and Gonzo and Paul Williams doing his songs. And uh, the guy that does Gonzo, Dave Goals, was wonderful. It was uh, really something to call the Henson Company and ask permission to use Gonzo Oh, we love Paul Williams. We'll do anything for him. <laughs> I was really glad I had Paul Williams. <laughs> the guy that wrote We've Only Just Begun. Yep. As it was a bank commercial at first. And somebody said, as he was finishing the commercial, you know, you finish that song and I'll get it to these two kids that are recording downstairs, uh, Karen and Richard Carpenter. I think mm -hmm. they, they can record it. And they did. And he, was able to pay for the car that he stole to drive to LA to become a songwriter. Wow. Become a songwriter. Yeah. And uh, anyway, Paul. He did, he did old fashioned love song, Free Dog Night. Yeah. He's the president of ASCAP now. Really? I didn't know that. Huh. And I has, miss, I missed two shows that you did around Florida. I, I don't know how I could have missed it. You, you showed up um and played with the doobie brothers at ruth eckard hall in clearwater oh that was fun wade boggs was there there's a picture of you with wade boggs and the doobies i missed that i don't know how i could have missed that because i cover ruth eckard hall in calvert and uh, clearwater and then you were at janice live with bob wire and the wolf brothers oh yeah on a sold cool. out show and again, I missed that one too. And I covered Janice live. I don't know. I don't know what happened. Well, I, uh, playing with Bob Weir, he was really fun. He'd, he'd come and sat in with me the month prior to that when I played Sweetwater in No Valley. Right. Which is a club that he supplied the PA system for. He came in and played for an hour with, with my guys and me. And then a month later, he's at Janice live. And mm -hmm. I gave him a call and said, you, can I get tickets? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you bring some instruments. And boy, I'm not trying to get a job sitting in. No, you got to sit in. Anyway, that was really fun. And uh, you did the pop in. That's what it was. 
And <laughs> do you get any coverage in Florida with your show? Yes. Oh, yeah. I'm going to be playing at McCurdy's Comedy Theater. Are you familiar that, with that? Yeah, that's five minutes from my house. Oh. Yeah. Uh, December 20th, I'll be at McCurdy's. I did not know that. I'll be there. I just booked it yesterday. Yeah. Um, Les and I have been Les trying. McCurdy, right? Les and I have been trying to find a date. Right. And we found that one, and he's doing music on Mondays. Okay. And uh, I'll meet. I'll I'll say hi to you there because do. I've been there many many times. I saw Sinbad there and uh, Arsenio Hall. He's got some good talent. Oh you know? yeah, Les is one of the old timers that is really making a name for himself and his yep. club. He's funny too. Yes, a funny guy. Yeah, did, did you you never saw the old club, did you? Before they moved. Yes. Oh, where they had this, the the uh, the hookers across the street. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and hookers. It was it was a the neighborhood was okay, but they still had hookers in that area. But he's got his new club now. It's beautiful. It's really really nice. Yeah, it's it's a perfect show business room. It is. Well, sure. I'll be there. I'll be there for sure. All right. Yep. Um, I may even review the show. Oh. Yeah. John, here's your final question. And I ask this question to everybody. I get some very interesting answers. If you had a Field of Dreams wish, like the movie, to perform, collaborate with anyone from the past or present, who would that be? Can I name two people? Sure. You can name a whole band. Uh well, let me see. I put on my own. Yeah. <laughs> the key cap. <laughs> with Paul McCartney and John Fogarty. Oh, all right. And uh, John Fogarty, because he knows my music. He knows yeah. what, what I have done. Right. I, I found out from him telling me at a festival one time, he named one of my albums. And I said, how do you know that? Well, that acoustic traveler song. Anyway. That was a nice relationship, a total shock, because I was like, John Fogarty is my favorite voice mm -hmm, on mm -hmm. the radio. And Paul McCartney, who wouldn't want to play with Paul McCartney? <laughs> How about mandolin, okay? Perfect. Uh, Perfect. A banjo with the Beatle guy? Uh, yeah. You know, it was, because uh, my, my brother told me if the banjo was any good, the Beatles would have used it. So <laughs> that's why I want to do something with McCartney. But that's just, yeah, I hope, yeah. It, hope it happens sometime. I'm surprised you haven't done anything with John Fogarty. Just, have, you, have you guys thought about it? Oh, uh, I've only talked to him at a couple of shows. I've, okay. And uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't looking for work. I, right. I was uh, just telling him how good I thought he's you know he's as good as he was with Credence he is um, he's facing that thing <clears throat> you know when he put out his first album he he had to take it out the record company sued him for infringement of style really it sounded too much like Credence Clearwater <laughs> you can't but help it he had to fight that and for years it really bothered him but he finally won because he was Creedence Clearwater. My mm -hmm. God, the guitar, the writing, the singing. Uh, but uh, I can't, was Saul Zance, was that the record company guy name? Saul, if it's not you, I'm sorry. If it is, <laughs> because the contract had it in it that he mm -hmm. could not replicate or do something like Creedence on his own. But <clears throat> that's another story. So he couldn't get the he didn't get the name. Somebody else got the name, huh? The CCR name, or they they yeah. had to be majority it's vote Creedence or whatever. Clearwater revisited. Right, right, right. Eden's Clearwater revival revisited. CCRR. Right. You no. Know, the, did they retire the original name? Is that what they did? CC the original. Yeah. Sometimes they'll do that. Remember the festival I told you about in Deadwood? Yeah. I tried to hire. Bachman Turner Overdrive was, cool. but I couldn't use Bachman Turner Overdrive exactly because Randy Bachman wasn't in the group. Yeah, I would use it if I sent him five thousand dollars. Uh huh. He didn't come. 
So it was BTO. Yeah. And uh, oh, you know, they're like they're they're a lot like Bachman Turner Overdrive. Actually, they are, <laughs> except they don't have <laughs> anyway. And now it's Bachman and Turner. There's no Overdrive anymore. Oh. Yeah. It's crazy. The name, it's crazy the, the name thing is difficult. Chicago made it work. Chicago Transit Authority. Yeah. To, to Chicago. Yeah. Little River Band didn't make it work. They changed to LRB. Yep. You know, who's LRB? Where do we file this record? Yeah. Uh, the Dirt Band, it didn't work. We yeah, yeah that's true. Band for a few years. I get yeah. my vote. The other guys outvoted me. Yeah. Uh -huh. I said, what are you crazy? 10 years of marketing. <laughs> Where are they going to file the record? Oh, they'll put it in the right. No. Yeah. But uh, that that got changed back. That yeah, it got changed back. That's right. Are you do you still play once in a while with those guys or no? No, no more. The 50th year. Yeah. I stepped off the bus at the end of the tour. Right. I stepped off the bus at the end of the tour and said, I gotta go. Right. Good luck. That and was it. They hired three more people and they go out now without a banjo player. That's crazy. <laughs> but you know, it's they they are fine. They yeah. do they sing great and they play great. They don't right. have Robinson, they don't have me, and uh, but they have a, a an incredible songbook mm -hmm. that has been guided by Jeff and Bobby and well, I, I don't, they don't do my songs anymore, but mm -hmm. and they, anyway, so yeah, I just got a, a text from a girl that went to see him in Deadwood, South Dakota. And uh, I said, did they start with, you ain't going nowhere? She goes, of course they did, <laughs> like they did 12 years ago. They did, they did the same set. Oh my God. You, know, you were the face of the band, though. You know, when you go to see the nitty gritty dirt band, and this is the truth, you look, everybody looks for you. You know, where's that tall guy with the banjo? <laughs> with my banjo and fiddle, guitar, and mandolin. Yeah. At the Cafe Wa, December 8th. That's right. You are the band. I'm awfully hoping, I'm hoping awfully, I'm, I, I really hope that people hear your broadcast before them and go to Cafe Wa. We'll pl we'll play it before that, and we'll play it again. I'll play it again before McCurdy's too. Oh, great. before that gig, we'll play it a couple of times. Yeah, John, I want to thank you so much, man, for being on the show today, and um, I'm glad you're coming back to Florida. You know, it, that's that's a good thing. A lot of people, not everybody, does come to Florida for some reason. Um, well, you can't go east or west. Yeah, you only go north and south. Right. Right. So, you know, think about it. You got a long state. It's a long state. And you've played somewhere on the way there. Yeah. Well, you're going to have to drive by it to get up to where the people are <laughs> in Georgia or wherever. It's a one day drive. And, yeah. and if you're, if you play somewhere on the way to Miami, then you're deadheading all the way back up for it. True. It's just, it's difficult. That is true. I want to say everybody purchased John McEwen's book, The Life I've picked a banjo player's nitty-gritty journey that's available now at amazon.com your latest solo release made in brooklyn five stars all the way incredible also available at amazon.com you can go to www.johnmcewen.com to visit his official site he's on facebook twitter and instagram john thank you so much man and i'll, I'll see you in sarasota well, like I said to my mother, thanks for having me. <laughs> That's good. I like that. <laughs> I appreciate it, man. And we'll see you soon. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, John. Bye-bye.